I'm giving away $1,000 this week. We'll be doing that live Wednesday evening, 8 p.m. Eastern Time on Mayo Media Network. Me and Jeff live from Vegas at the Stadium Swim at the Circa Hotel. Gonna be a blast doing our shows from there, but we'll be giving away four winners. 250 bucks a piece. You want to know how to get into the draw? Just hit the description. It's all down there. Video, audio, doesn't matter. In the description, there's also the link to the Mayo Masters Content Hub. So you don't miss a thing. I created a drop page in my sub stack, which you should sub to. It's free. You might as well do it. But the link is down there as well if you want to bookmark that and check back to make sure that you don't miss on any promos, giveaways, and all of the content that we have coming out already. I've already released the Masters Mega Preview on both the pod and video feed. So you can check that out after you watch this. And since you were so good, to sit through that little spiel. I got a surprise for you. Well, you can use code Mayo at Underdog Fantasy as well and unlock some big bonuses this week. But here are the bets for the Masters. You're going to find out all this stuff in the research and why I've come to these three guys. But here's what I got so far. Hideki Matsuyama, 25 to 1. Shane Lowry, 50 to 1. Sahith Tagawa, my official pick for the 2024 Masters, 60 to 1. And those might not be the best numbers available. We might get better numbers come Monday. So keep an eye out on that, all right? Here's why I made those picks and the other players that I like this week in the Masters Research. Let's go. Welcome. The Pat Mayo Experience, presented by Underdog Fantasy, Masters Research, early bets, picks, and the statistical walkthrough of all the players and the course. The one-stop shop that you need is all here on Mayo Media Network this week. If you missed the Masters Mega Preview, which dropped on Friday evening, it's all right. If you hit the description right now or are a sub to the free sub stack that I put out, I have created a drop page called the Masters Content Hub. Every time a new piece of content ends up coming out for the week, it'll get embedded in there. You can hit that link down in the description right now and get the Masters Mega Preview, the top 50 players in the world, my column in Golf Digest, plus everything else that's going to be coming out throughout the week. There'll be, I think, two more newsletters coming out before tee off on Thursday at Augusta National. I'll have my giant course preview on Monday, and I'll have even a bit on Sunday evening as well, if you want to go check that out about the field itself. So we have all that stuff. I'm giving away a thousand bucks as well. I divvied it up into four pieces so four people can win. But if you rate and review the audio podcast for the Pat Mayo experience, both on Apple and Spotify, you get 10 ballots a piece in the draw to go do that. And if you use code Mayo at Underdog Fantasy right now, not only do you get a deposit match of up to $100, not only do you unlock an additional free square for the pick'em on Thursday with Jordan Spieth over under five strokes. You want to go over on that one. You also get 30 ballots in the draw for the thousand bucks. So please go do that. And I, I have the tracking of the code Mayo. So boom, you just, you're automatically in and you know, super easy to do. You're going to be wanting to play on underdog fantasy. Anyway, there's still major season drafts to be done. I'm going to be doing like a hundred of them this week. I want to see you in that lobby. All right. But before I actually get into everything, I did want to start, um, a little bit about the TV ratings, uh, both for the Masters and what we've seen so far on the PGA Tour, because they are down. It is not looking good. And although that the caffeine app that the Live is running, say that 30 billion, jillion, how many people are watching Live, the actual TV ratings are absolutely terrible as well, as is like the YouTube feed. So interest in golf as a whole is down. So this is one of three things that could potentially be happening. Number one, This is all just a majors psyop. They knew that ratings overall on television, even, I mean, not the NFL, but for most sports are just way down in general. So what you do is you see that coming, you know it's going to come down. So you create live and then you make it fractured. So you have basically go all in on all four of the majors where these two collection of tours play against each other at the same time to really drum up interest. Now that one's Probably not true. So let's just throw that one off to the side. Number two, people are ultimately disenfranchised because so many of the top players left and all the players on both tours just seem like a bunch of whiners who are arguing over like $300 million. The entitlement is absolutely off the charts. That one probably holds a lot of merit to it. But here's the thing. 
I actually think it's number three, what we're seeing right now. And I, I don't disagree that interest in golf is down, especially since Liv broke off. But even if you put them back together, it's fun for the four tournaments a year that we see. And it will boost the ratings for all of those versus everything else that happens in golf. But for your average run-of-the-mill PGA Tour event or even Live event... There's one particular thing that stands out to me that is not happening right now that used to be happening. And even when but you go back and look at around, I don't know, 12 years ago, very much the same thing. The lack of Tiger Woods is ultimately, I think, what is responsible for the downturn in ratings. Not that he's been around a ton, but we're now getting the trickle out effect that people are just losing interest because they only became golf fans because they love Tiger Woods. It's going to be no different than when we look back at the NCAA Women's Tournament ratings on ESPN three years from now when Caitlin Clark is not playing in these games and people will be like, hmm, I wonder what happened to all these ratings. Well, you had a generational person inside these contests that people actively wanted to tune in to see. Tiger Woods was that guy. As much as we want to say that Rory's a draw and Scheffler's a draw and Rom and Brooks and Bryson, like within golf, all those guys are draws. They make me excited to go watch a tournament. I'm sure that if you're tuning into a master's research show, absolutely the same case for you as well. But for your casual, my dad who's tuning in, it doesn't really move the needle. The only one that really moves the needle that I know who watches golf very casually is Rory with my 87 year old grandma because she hates Rory and all she wants to do is tune in to see him lose every single Sunday. I don't really know why that's the case or what her beef is with Rory, but she hates Rory McIlroy and that gets her to tune in. But, there is only really one player, and I think that we talked about this about a year and a half ago. Like, who is an actual needle mover when it comes to the PGA Tour? That's not Tiger Woods. There's no one even in the stratosphere of Tiger. But Spieth is really the only one. And you can go back and look at the tournaments where he's been in contention. It's not hard to do because he has been infrequently in contention over the past 18 months. But the one that really sticks out in my mind is, that actually, actually, there's two cases. One is last year's Heritage when Fitzpatrick beat him in the playoff. Ratings for that were like off the charts versus what everything else is everything else at the Heritage had previously done because Spieth was in the mix. Casuals tune in to watch Jordan Spieth. The other big one, although the tournament itself was very good this year, Valspar was down like 25%. People are like, oh, it's a bad tournament. It's always the same tournament every single year with the same like crappy field that we see. The only difference between this year, the previous years, and then last year as an outlier is Jordan Spieth was in contention all the way down on Sunday, and that helps out ratings. He is the only one that seems to draw any interest from the public to boost this up. I've just been digging into the numbers and digging into the research of the TV ratings to try to find some sort of through line with this. And we're now enough past, because like I mentioned, Tiger hasn't been around all that much. He is here this week, so that's going to be a big boost to the ratings and just general interest, especially if he has like a decent Thursday. People want to tune in to make sure they watch every single Tiger shot. There was a reason that even when he wasn't in contention at some of these tournaments. He was like T47 that they would still show every single shot of Tiger. You get a Tiger only feed on like ESPN plus if you really wanted to. But it's now been years since, I mean, he won the Masters in 2019. He had a decent run just after the pandemic coming out of that. Like he was still around, but he's been like out of sight, out of mind for like two years now. So the lack of Tiger combined with a lot of these big names leaving to make the tournaments both seem less competitive at the very high end that they used to be. And just, again, people just calling them all whiny babies. They're like, oh, $100 million isn't good enough for you? Sorry, you needed $500 million. When you're the casual fan, I get that golf is pretty uppity to begin with, but like, come on. No one has any sympathy for these guys who are literally arguing about hundreds of millions of dollars to line their pockets with. So you have that frustration and the entitlement and then the no tiger, and you're getting what we're getting right now. So golf needs to build itself some new stars and hopefully having everyone together that we get some really competitive leaderboards and obviously the leaderboards that have happened so far this year like most casual players can't name the guys who have won the tournaments coming down the stretch on Sunday that's not super helpful I've really enjoyed it not so much from a betting perspective but from a viewing perspective I find that exciting and eventually that will pay dividends if someone like Nick Dunlap ends up becoming a big star because you saw him here and then you'll see him here and then you recognize him he's going to be in the tournament this week that if you can build guys up that way that's the only way to kind of stave this off because here's the question. If Liv and PGA merged and all these guys were back in the same tournaments again, playing every single week, yeah, I think you would see probably a quick boost in the ratings, but a year from now after people were over it and that excitement was over, 
would they just go back to what they are now? The answer is probably. Let's dig into the field. Apologies for the quality of the flyover, that it's an EA sports game, but the Masters and Augusta National are very protective with the rights, and I don't want them coming after me, especially this week, because this is going to be a show that I think a lot of people are going to tune into. And if you are feeling despair this week, you don't have to. The Masters is comfort food that, like, even hipsters, golf hipsters, still love the Masters. It's just fun. And if you're feeling alone, there's no need to worry. Jim Nance is on the call at Augusta, and he's friends with everyone. He will be your friend. I am almost certain of that. The year's first major currently, as I record this, has 88 players in the field. Fingers crossed, Akshay Bhatia gets himself in that field, and we come in flush with money to bet on the Masters after hitting a 65-1. to But right now, as I'm recording it, it's 88 players, and the winner of the Valero Texas Open would get in if they're not previously qualified. But basically, everyone who's not Brendan Todd, like the next eight guys on the leaderboard going into Sunday, are all qualified already. So only Batia and Todd would have the chance to get in. And since these signature events have become a thing that we've seen on the PGA, the top players square off against each other far more often than we're used to seeing over and over. And that's great and everything, but the Masters, and all the majors for that matter, carry even more significance than usual this time around. Now that we get the PGA's best, squaring off with their Mirror Universe counterparts in the Live Tour. And although Live tournaments don't award world rankings points, it's still early enough in the process that the live players remain qualified based on their performance pre-defection. Some of them carry over eligibility. Guys like Hatton got themselves into the Tour Championship last year, so they're eligible for almost everything. And all former Master Champs are in Augusta. Liv took a bunch of those guys. It's like the NWO. Those guys are in four life. The, and any major winner has a five-year exemption anyway if you win any of the majors and guys who finish high at majors from the previous year. So from Liv, the reigning Masters champ John Rahm and the reigning PGA champion Brooks Kepka headlined the Liv guys. Overall, there's 13 of them in the field. That's down from 17 a year ago. Rom Brooks, Cam Smith, Dustin Johnson, Neiman, Reed, Bubba, Sergio is looking pretty good through two rounds at Doral. Bryson, Hatton, Moronkadonk, the Polish giraffe, we get to see him at Augusta. Charles Schwartzel and Phil Mickelson. Overall, they make up 14% of the field. And adding these guys into the mix makes the Masters almost the same as like every other year. It's not like these guys are like the Red Army from the 70s. We don't know what's going on in Soviet Union. We can have, everyone has YouTube. You got the internet. You're watching this on the internet, likely, right now. And shout out to our friends on Game TV watching this up in Canada on their actual TV box. But you know what they're up to, and... It's not like there's going to be any surprises. I mean, obviously, there will be a surprise or two. No one really predicted that Reed and Phil would come in and come in second last year, although they had no chance of winning that tournament. They still came T2. That's pretty good. Uh, these guys come with decades of experience at the course. 19 players in the field, though, have never played a competitive round at the Masters. The debutantes. And there's two of them that are, listen, are very good players. When I, I released my top 50 players in the world ranking. You can check that out both in Golf Digest. The full video breakdown is up on Mayo Media Network in the podcast feed right now. It's also in that Masters Content Hub that I talked about down in the description that you have Wyndham Clark and Ludwig Oberg that these are two like legit players. I had Wyndham Clark ranked number three overall. He's won three times, including a major championship, just came runner up at Bay Hill, just came runner up at the players. Like dude is ready, but he's never played here before. Same as Oberg, they're debutantes, but they seem like they're a lot better than this. And I am required to tell you that no debutante has donned sports' highest sartorial honor since Fuzzy Zeller in 1979. But that's not to say that debutantes will fail. We've had some pretty close calls in recent years. Jordan Spieth was second. Will Zalatoris was second. Sung Jae Im were in second place and got a runner-up paycheck at Augusta National in their debuts. The Gala was the only rookie last year to finish inside the top 10 at the Masters. And it's far from a secret, I mean, based on that, really, that experience is a massive edge. Augusta's a unique course with massive elevation changes, and there's generally a learning curve for first-time players who need to figure out the breaks and angles on the fly, and the lack of green books for the players and caddies make that ingrained knowledge a very distinct advantage the more times that you have played it. And to pile on to the lack of reps at the course, you need to be aware of poor recent Masters results too. Beyond the outlier that was Patrick Reed in 2018, the past 24 champions not only have played the event the previous year, but they also made the cut the previous year. After Reed, it was a fresh-faced kid named Tiger Woods who was the last winner to miss the cut the year before and then achieve immortality 12 months later. And that was in 1997. 
And as much as I want to invest in the long shots, Masters is almost always won by one of the elite players. Since 2012, Bubba Watson was the lowest ranked player in the world to claim victory. Bubba was 18th in the world rankings when Charles Schwartzel helped him get into that green jacket for the first time. Now, the world rankings are useless at this point, but that's why I kind of created the top 50 in the world to give you a sense of the guys that I think should have that distinction at the moment coming into this tournament. And a lot of people think that because we hit a 150 to 1 long shot on Danny Willett to win the Masters, he was the number 12 ranked player in the world when they teed off at the Masters. You know, he got the win in Dubai. That's why we bet him. Then he played some great golf through February and March. He even had a nice showing at Doral before he won in 2016. He went off at 50 to 1. He didn't go off at 150 to 1. We just happened to bet him in January at 150 to 1. Those future odds like no longer exist, by the way, for the Masters or any major's future market. They got caught on. They didn't want to get caught again. So if there's a guy near the top of the board or even in that middle range that's not playing great golf coming in at the moment, then wait till Monday when the odds reset. You'll likely get a better number on him. In full disclosure, I'll reveal this later too when I write it down in the time codes, but you can know right now, I hit Hideki 25-1 to 1 today to win the Masters because... If he comes top five at Valero, that's going to go down. I saw he was 14 at FanDuel already, but he's 25 at DK, 25 at Bodog, 25 at Pet365. Like, you know, normal books have him at 25 to 1. But he will be 20 to 1, 22 to 1. And if it gets so bad, I'll, I'll cash it out on Bet365 and, you know, bet him at 28 to 1. A lot like I did this week at the Valero Open. As I said before, 88 players in the field, the top 50 in ties are going to make the cut. COVID wiped out the all players within 10 strokes of the lead rule, and they just never put it back in because they were dealing with shorter days when they contested it in November. But that's it. But over 55% of the players are going to make the cut. Just based on that math, it could be more if a whole bunch of people tie for the very last spot to get in. And just because you squeeze all six players through in your DraftKings lineup this week doesn't really mean much if you have a squad of guys who are not near the top of the leaderboard. In previous years, too, the to-make-the-cut parlay was an incredibly plus EV wager, but sportsbooks caught on to that, and some won't even let you parlay those together. But other ones just killed the odds dramatically to the point where it's not so much fun to bet it anymore. Maybe this year will be different once they, leave, once they release those markets, but I don't hold out the highest hopes. Basically, for DraftKings, don't use the losers at the bottom, the amateurs, the old dudes, the Mike Weirs, VJ Sings. People have it in their mind that, like, that year that Bernhard Langer, you know, he competed. That was the Danny Willett year in 2016. So that was in 2016. It's almost a decade ago, by the way. And he still came T24 that year. He was T29 at the 2020 Masters in November, but he still finished outside the top 30 in DraftKings scoring. Like, that's not going to help you win a GPP. It's like, well, Fred Couples, got to use Fred Couples. He'll alleviate so many of the problems that I have in my lineups. Now, he finished T50 last year and missed the cut the four years before that. It's just people don't remember things anymore year to year to year that the last actual good performance that these guys had happened a really long time ago. And if you don't have the winner, two other guys in the top five, another two in the top 10, and someone else who like outperforms their scoring position by having like an eagle or a hole in one, like you're basically drawing dead in the millionaire maker. So you really need to figure it out that way. If you don't think that Mike Weir is going to be inside the top 10, well, you can't take that guy. I mean, you shouldn't take him anyway. Although I did win a big Weir versus Kevin Na head to head last year in the opening two ball after <laughs> Na withdrew from the tournament. That was great. Cashin, Mike Weir, 4-1, to one, head-to-heads. It was just too big of a number, basically against anyone, and Nah was playing horrible golf coming in. So that's the field, that's the players, and those are some of the trends and some DFS strategy that you can get behind. There's also the $10 Albatross on Underdog Fantasy right now. Use code MAYO to get yourself, and there's 50 k to first place. It's a all-majors draft. So you draft for all four of the majors. you got to get your team 2 of 6. You have to be 2. You have to be in the top two of the six in your pod to advance to the PGA Championship and advance all the way down. And you can do that with Code Mayo right now. First time deposit match of 100 bucks and this special. Head over to Underdog Fantasy right now. Get that deposit match of up to 100 bucks. But if you use Code Mayo with the Masters coming up, we got some extra special bonuses for you on top of everything. If you use Code Mayo right now at underdogfantasy.com, you will unlock not one, but two free squares for Masters Week. You'll get the Scotty Scheffler free square that everyone is getting higher or lower than 0.5 strokes on Thursday. However, by using code Mayo, you unlock the Jordan Spieth free square 
for Thursday, higher or lower than 0.5 strokes as well. Those will become available Tuesday of Masters Week, but get in now at Underdog Fantasy using code Mayo to make sure that you have the best advantages possible. Let's jump over to Fantasy National right now and get started with all the statistical research about the course and the players. Again, fantasynational.com slash mayo gets you 20% off, and you're probably going to want, if you just signed up for Underdog, which you should do for not only your benefit, but also you know, to get in the draw for the thousand bucks. We have a new tab at the very top called Over Under. It's a new tool that Moose built out. Uh, You have to manually type it in, which is somewhat frustrating, but Underdog doesn't have an API that we can import, but you can choose your player. So Jordan Spieth is a player that we can go to, and that free square is going to be 0.5 strokes. So we'll see how that rates out in the simulator. 0.5, easy game. Let's see, go. Oh, 100% on the over. So there's the free square for you right there. But you can put in all of any of the Pick'em site's numbers, and we will calculate the probability in each individual round for you. So please go check that out. Just another tool that you can have. Also, the scroll down on the left-hand side, you can get the Masters filter, where it just sorts by Masters strokes gained. Um, And we'll take a look at everything going in, because I do want to look at recent form itself. But I want to start with the course course breakdown for Augusta National. uh, What do we got here? 7,510 yards. You all know the course. If you've tuned into a show on YouTube or downloaded a podcast about the Masters, I assume you're pretty familiar with Augusta National to begin with. The key stats this week are going to be approach. It's a second shot course. I mean, Justin Ray even emphasized that even more on the Mega Masters preview when we did the walkthrough for everything. Other than that, course history, we'll build a mixed condition model that factors that in. Strokes gained off the tee, the short game, the the local knowledge about short game here, and then driving distance. Although accuracy did mean a lot more because there were fewer birdies made from the rough last year especially, but over the course of the past three years than almost any other place and any any other time in history at Augusta National. But 75% of people hit the fairway last year. So it's not like, oh, you need to have an accuracy guy off the tee. It's like, no, you have to hope your bomber hits a bunch of fairways and then you're absolutely fine. Then you have the true biggest advantage possible. Not a shocker that Rom Brooks and, you know, I mean, if Scheffler could have made a putt last year, he probably would have won him all honesty, but the guys at Bomet who hit a ton of fairways. <clears throat> you see the long holes, you got five of them, 450 to 500 yards. You got one of them that's over 500 yards. These are bent grass greens and they are super fast. Take a look back at the historical cut line, plus four a year ago, five the year before that, one over in 2021 in the 2019, it was plus four, plus six, plus seven. The weather doesn't look as bad. Right now, driving accuracy overall 68%, but again, it was 75% last year, so far more people hit the fairway at Augusta National than almost anywhere else, but far fewer actually hit greens in regulation. The scrambling percentage is much lower than it is for your average tour event because these are complex greens to both chip and to putt on. Three putts abound at the course. So that's what we're looking at in terms of how the course actually sets up. You know, distance, long irons, all that fun stuff. You have to take advantage of the power fives or you're likely to have absolutely no chance whatsoever. In terms of course history, we can just kind of cycle back through the past few years. Rom obviously beat Brooks and Phil. Spieth, Reed, and Henley all came inside the top four. Uh, Rom wins at 12 under, I think it was. Yeah, 12 under. Scotty won the year before that at 9 under. Hideki won at 10 under over Zalatoris, Spieth, and Xander. We take a look at the overall strokes gain total at the Masters over the past five years. Your top 10 players are John Rom, Scotty Scheffler, Hideki Matsuyama, And Scheffler didn't even play one of those years. He didn't play in 2019. He's never finished outside the top 20 at the Masters in his career. Rom, Scotty, Hideki, Xander, Cam Smith. Those are the top five. Then you got DJ, Reed, Kepka, Thomas, and Morikawa. The interesting thing about Reed is he has these three top tens the past four years. These strokes gained do not include his win in 2018. That's just how good that he has been at Augusta National. He has these greens figured out. He can get himself up and down, no problem. Other than that, you got Morikawa, who has two top six finishes and a WD at the Masters. Uh, Spieth is up there as well. I mean, he had the one missed cut in 2022, but top fives in the other two appearances the past two years. Finau, Rory, Hovland, there's Shane Lowry. Shane Lowry is one of three players to finish inside the top 25 each of the past three years. Who is it? It is Shane Lowry, Scheffler, and no, it's not Rom. Who is the other guy? 
uh, Scheffler, there he is. Uh, Colin Morikawa, actually, with a T10, T5, and T18 the past three years. So you do want to lean on this. If we kind of take a look at some of the guys where you just said, you know, who's not gonna who's not gonna win? Basically, the guys who missed the cut last year. That's only happened with Patrick Reed. Before that, as I mentioned, Tiger Woods in 1997. So probably, I mean, all of these players you can make a very compelling case for that they're going to win. If you wanted to tell me that Rory won, I could understand how Rory wins. He's an excellent player. You know, he was the runner-up in 2022. He was T5 in 2021. We thought that he was going to win this in 2010. It just didn't happen for him when he shot an 80 on Sunday as a very, very young player. Uh, so I would not throw Zalatoris in this, but if you need a way to whittle this down, just let some of these decisions be made for you in this way. So no Thomas, no Rory, no Connors. In terms of an outright winning bet, no Harmon, who I'm pretty sure is going to be cusp picked to win this. No Sergio, and Sergio is going to be popular, especially when he's doing it to Ral right now. But he has been bad at the Masters since he won the Masters in 2017. Bryson was cut. I never liked Bryson here anyway. And then you just have a whole bunch of people who didn't play the year before. You can almost cross all these guys off the list too, because as I mentioned, not only did the players play the year before, they also also made the cut. So I guess that would take out Zalatoris in that instance. So there's a lot of first-time players or players that just have not played in the Masters in a while. It's been three full years since Ricky Fowler teed it up at Augusta, and he had a very good Masters track record before that. Some of the guys that hung on from way down in the field, I mean, Dustin kind of imploded. I think I bet on Dustin, so that makes sense. T48 last year. Thanks for nothing, Dustin. He did win in 2021 and lost to Tiger in 2019 before that. But like Taylor Moore is someone I like this week is a DraftKings play at 6400 bucks. You can see I had the star next to him already. His around the green game has started to surge. I especially liked what he did in Houston when he came T2. And he had a top 40 in his first ever appearance here a year ago. So that's encouraging to see. Hatton's playing some better golf this week at Doral so far uh, so maybe he can improve a little bit post would be would have been a look if he had been playing better golf coming in Finau is a very interesting one to me just because the ball striking has been so good for Tony Finau coming in it was the Valspar was bad but other than that like look at these strokes gained approach numbers look at these driving numbers no he can't putt it's a problem that's why he's not winning tournaments but he has played very well at Augusta National in the past. So maybe that this just you fuse the ball strike. We've seen bad putter. I mean, it's funny because Liv tweeted out this week that it does Sergio Garcia have the best putting stroke on the planet because he gained like three strokes putting round one at Doral. It's like abs- this is the same Sergio Garcia who won the Sanderson Farms with his eyes closed putting because his putting was so bad. Like that's been the knock on Sergio historically. It's just funny when they just drop these weird things. It was like, no, he does not have the best putting stroke in the world it'd be like saying that will zalatoris has the best putting stroke in the world he absolutely does not have that at all who else are we looking at here in terms of who did well a year ago uh, that might be somewhat surprising fitz has gotten better each of the past four years and did have a top 10 in 2016 as well but he cracked the top 10 last year he's not having a very good go but he's almost someone that you can throw it out with in terms of what their recent form is like and i feel like we're just seeing glimpses enough glimpses of what he's up to he's not on this terrible run like he had from the tour championship on although he did win in europe during that time uh, after the tour championship but he just started out this year so poorly and it's starting to come back a little bit obviously the players doesn't have a lot of crossover with a Augusta National, especially in the driving, but the approach play, I mean, that's something that you can always kind of lean on. Anyone with good approach play coming in is someone that you're going to want to look at uh, as especially if they're not as popular as maybe you think. I mean, Xander's been great outside of 2022. He has a top 20, I think, in every start. He has top 20 in seven straight major championships. And then he was cut in 2022 with the Masters. So, you know, Xander's, I don't want to say is safe. No one is safe here. But it's like for a guy that you're probably not going to bet to win, just bet Xander top 10. That might be like the bet of the week. And then Rory, of all the top guys, the only one who got cut at last year's tournament. So we saw the field. As I mentioned, there's 88 players who are teeing off at Augusta National, so we can start running the model on this, and we can check out the model that I have in. I showed this off on the, me- the Mega Master Show that I did with Raza when I was talking about the DraftKings pricing, 
and it just weights everything. I'll show you the weightings right now, and this will probably this will appear in the Monday newsletter, I think, or maybe you won't. Maybe I'll put this in the Sunday newsletter as people start getting their research ready. Again, fantasynational.com slash mayo. And once you're a member, you get access to the like awesome leaderboard app that we've been using now for like two months. The members are loving it. Uh, it's way better than the PGA Tour app. Unfortunately, it's not as good as the Masters app, so you're going to want to use the Masters app this week. And then you can come back and use the Fantasy National app. It's no extra charge. Just anyone who is a member gets access to that. I'm very excited to test out these pick'em pools, these pick'em simulators as well. Because, I mean, Kenny Kim is like the king of that. And I, you know what? I'm not going to tell you who the new co-host. Tambo is leaving Fantasy Golf Degenerates, if people didn't hear. He's still going to appear with me on Wednesdays and do all the stuff over at Ship It Nation. He's just running a bit thin on time, and that was the thing that had to go. And fortunately, we had someone in the wings waiting to chat with Kenny every single week every single week and you're absolutely going to love who it is. So I'll leave that to them to announce who it's going to be, but Tambo and Kenny already have their Masters DraftKings show out on Mayo Media Network, uh, so you can check that out and then starting at the Heritage Kenny will have a brand new co-host, someone who is not, let's say, unfamiliar with viewers of the Pat Mayo experience. How about that? I have strokes gained off the tee weighted at 20% I also have driving distance weighted at 10%, so 30% overall for driving. Approach play, I have at 30%, so higher than higher than driving, or well, the same as driving, but there's other things that go into it, because I have a proximity range of 175 to 200. I have that weighted at 5%. Eagles gained 5%. I could probably, you know what, I'm going to jack up, approach a little bit more. You know, it's second shot course, got to have approach in there. So let's make that 35% to make sure it has a specific lean over off the tee. Par 4s, 450 to 500 yards, 5%. That key proximity range, 5%. Stroke skiing short game, 9%. Eagles and par 5s, 500 to 600 yards are both at 5%. Par 4s in general weighted at 9%. But that's all encompassing. That's going to tell you, I mean, you really don't have any idea unless you go in and look at the individual player who is actually doing this on approach or putting or chipping based on par fours. But it's going to take the average weight of all of this. So if we go into the rolling model, we can highlight the masters and we can take a look at how this has worked over the past four, eight, 12, 24, whatever it might be around, however you want to weight it. You can go into the masters rolling model and I do what I always kind of do. I weight eight in 12, the highest, you know, the, the most recent form coming in. I have 24 very close to that. And then we drop down 50 and 100 close to past four. So like, what did you do last week? You know, that's important, but it's not nearly as important. It's half or less of eight, 12, and 24. Uh, and we're going to make those over 20% a piece. Then last 50 and 100. We want to get that long-term form in there as well, just to see if there's anything off kilter with the baseline of a lot of these players. So you load that in, then boom, you know, Scotty Scheffler, the number one player. And the one problem is, is Liv doesn't actually like have stats that are easily translatable or in the strokes gain metric. So a lot of the live guys are inevitably going to be hurt by this, or they're going to go way up in the rankings because of this. So we're not getting any bad Brooks performances as it pertains to any of these numbers. And we take a look at like the stats that he has weighted. It's all major championships where he tends to play pretty well. He had a first a runner up and another top 20 at major championships a year ago. But I would take the live guys with a grain of salt, to be perfectly honest with you, if you're looking at specific stats. But that's why I still wanted to include the last 100 in this because a lot of guys that left are just going to have a baseline of stats from the PGA Tour that we can use to our advantage. So the top 10 rolling model right now, Scheffler, Xander, Lowry, top three, Hideki and Wyndham Clark are the next two, Brooks, Cam Young, Ludwig, Sahith Tagala, and Corey Connors. Then it's Cam Smith, Finau, Bryson, Rory, and C. Woo! Kim, got to put a star next to Si Wu's name. He, Si Wu is playing incredible golf at the moment. I don't think that people have really caught on to how good his tee to green game has been. Look at this. He had a bad Genesis, which is not great for the Masters because that is the primary crossover course. His putting has been absolutely abysmal, but and the results haven't quite been there. But 9, 7.3, 9.1, 6.6, 5.7, 6.3. So he's gained basically an average of seven and a half strokes tee to green in six of his past seven tournaments in his past three he's up around like eight and a half it's pretty amazing the approach is top notch still one of the best short game players in the world it has not necessarily he's been in the mix 
sometimes at the Masters. He's only missed one cut, so he's made six cuts in a row at Augusta. He's just never really challenged for a win. I think it was 2021 when he broke his putter because he got so pissed off at how poorly he was putting. He actually putted better with his five wood that year. So he's 7100 bucks on DraftKings. I'd, I'd probably, listen, I'm probably not going to bet him to win. I might bet him to come inside the top 20. Maybe if he's like around even money that maybe that I've just to dump a big to make the cut on Siwoo, but he's playing incredible golf right now. And listen, the stress is off of him about avoiding military service. He's going to avoid military service. He and Sungjae claimed that gold medal at the Asian Games, so they are off the hook for the mandatory military service in South Korea. Maybe that's the weight off of his mind, but it's nice to see him up there. After him, it's Hatton, Jagabombs, who just won, Harmon, Hovland, and then there's Taylor Moore, number 20, a spot above Neiman. Obviously, this does not include any of Neiman's three wins. So again, take those guys with a grain of salt from that perspective if you're thinking about live guys. So what I'm going to do now is build out the mixed condition model. The MCM, and this is just going to take the different factors of the course. I have mine built up for Valero. It told me bet Batia, so I did. Hopefully he wins. It did not tell me to bet Denny McCarthy. So that could be a problem um, if Denny ends up winning. I have the going into Sunday, I have three of the top four guys on the leaderboard. I do not have Denny. So if you want to make some money, just bet on Denny because hitting winners is hard. And everyone that you know has an Akshay ticket at at least 60 to 1. So a group win would be fantastic for all of us. I know a lot of you listening out there have Akshay tickets this week. But knowing how we all run, a four-shot lead is not good enough when you have the hero, never one on tour, Denny McCarthy, trying to chase you down. Can Denny just shoot 74? That would just be optimal. I don't need Batia to go out and have to shoot like 65 in order. I mean, 65, he, if he shoots 65, he's going to win. I don't need him to have to shoot like press to shoot 68 in order to win. Just have a bad day, Denny. Someone call Denny's like hotel room tonight and just like make sure he's up all night or do something to him. Just we can't have him making a run. What I'm going to do is add this. This is going to be the model influence inside my mixed condition model. So I'm going to add that in. And it'll be weighted, you know, we'll wait it, whatever. We'll get to the weightings after. I'm going to get rid of that. So we'll update the mixed condition model and we'll move on our way from the rolling report in the Masters app. It's always helpful to refresh the page when this comes in. So the biggest thing, I mean, it's not the biggest thing, but what I want to take a look at now is we'll take 2023, 2022, 2021. And I guess we'll take the 2020 Masters as well. Why not? And we'll go back to 2019. So we'll take the past five years at the Masters and we'll just go down to this very handy Masters tab. Bleep. And we'll just take the data from those five years. It's only strokes gain total. That's proprietary to Augusta National. But what we can do is go by average and see the average strokes gain total. Uh, Will Zalatoris, by far the best player on a per round basis of anyone in the field over five years. Now that's only eight rounds, but he's gaining almost three strokes per round on the field. Rom, then Thigala, Scheffler, and Shoffley. If you've been watching the show for any length of time, you already know that I have a 60 to one Sahith to Gala ticket in order to win. I just love how Sahith sets up at this course. Uh, it, he just has shades of Cam Smith and Spieth in my mind. Like he has magic around the greens. He's a very good putter. And the difference between Sahith and those guys is obviously they have all the experience. They played really well at Augusta over the years, but Sahith is an amazing driver compared to those guys because they're god awful off the tees. The problem with Sahith, when we look at it, is his approach play. It's either great or not good whatsoever. And it's been good coming in. He's gained at least three strokes in each of his past two tournaments. Before that, it was not good at the Arnold Palmer. Still came six because the chipping and the putting. Look at these putting numbers. If he had just putted a little bit more in Houston, it was actually good the T28 for his number and maybe taking some people off of his scent because I, you know, we, I didn't have bet him to win in Houston. I didn't really care what he did, but it was nice to see that he gained almost seven strokes T to green, mainly through driving and approach, and the result wasn't good because he dropped strokes for the first time since Hawaii on the green. So if he can rebound nicely here, we're looking at him. So you can see he came ninth at the Masters last year, and the other poor performance he had approach-wise was at Riv, which is not great, but he's had some decent results at, he's made the cut twice in his first two appearances, and he came sixth a year ago at Riviera, gaining 7.3 strokes on those greens. But here's the key thing. It's the gaining around the green at Riviera. The green complexes at Riviera are completely unique versus so many different places, much like they are at Augusta National. 
So, like, Bubba Watson can only chip at two places on Earth, Riviera and Augusta. The speed control, the weird undulations, getting it to the right tier, understanding where to miss. Sahith may have that in the bag. That's why I like him this week. Listen, I at 60-1, to 1, he should probably be longer than that, to be perfectly honest with you. But, you know, we got to try to find some winners here somewhere, right? So, the top five, Zalatoris, Romthi, Gala, Scheffler, Xander on a per-round basis. Rom has 20 rounds, Xander has 18. Then it's Brooks, Hideki, Dustin, Henley, Justin Thomas, Cam Smith, Tom Kim in only four rounds. Tom Kitten seems broken at the moment. He withdrew from the players with an illness. He was awful, awful in his return this week at Valera. I think he ended up plus six and missed the cut. That's not great. Reed Morikawa, Fowler, only eight rounds going back the past five years. Sungjae, Chris Kirk is actually up there as well. He's only had one Masters appearance in the past five years. That or he missed the cut twice, which would seem unlikely if he's gaining 1.25 strokes per round on the field. Lowry, despite those top 25 finishes, never really been in contention. I know he came third one year, but it never felt like he was ever actually going to win that year because no one was beating Scheffler. That was the problem. Phil Connors, Thorbjorn. I like Thorbjorn this weekend. It's nice to see him playing really well tee to green in Valero because I wanted to see something from him. He has a spotty-ish Masters track record, but he does have a top 10, albeit like a decade ago. Actually, it was more than a decade ago at this point. But he's only played it three times in his life, a 6th, a 44th, and a 21st. So he seems to grasp the layout since he's never missed a cut. And he's actually coming in despite, you know, not looking so good here on paper. Three straight missed cuts. And in 46th in Mexico, he won earlier this year on the DP World Tour, beating out Rasmus Hoygaard in that event. And he's currently top 10 at Valero. And honestly, his TD Green game and ball striking especially is looking very good at the moment. So if he does have familiarity and he's shown that he can make the cut and prove to have a top 10 here, no one's really going to be on Thorbjorn at $6,500 on DraftKings. I'm not talking about betting this guy outright here, but Bubba's having a great week, so Bubba's going to get steam. Sergio's like 6800 He's going to get steam because he's currently winning that event. Uh, probably even, I mean, Taylor Moore and Olison are the two guys that I really like from down here, but... And Keegan's going to draw interest. Nat might draw interest just because people like them. Same as Grio, Because Grio, I don't want to say he's been on like a great run, but he's just playing some pretty solid golf coming in for a guy of that price. Like he fizzled out at the players, had a very poor final round. But other than that, he's gaining off the tee almost every single time. You know, he's been gaining on approach almost every single time. He's around the green. is terrible. But he's actually putting a little bit now. And he's made the cut in all three of his appearances at the Masters as well. So I'm just thinking about guys that will suck up ownership around that range. Nikolai Hoygaard, who I just keep losing money on on underdog every single day of stupid Valero because he just can't putt. I believe he is five strokes lost through three rounds now on the greens, but the ball striking has been sneaky good, which is inevitably going to get me back on him this year. I can't remember if he, I don't believe he's a debut. No, he is a debutant. So maybe I won't like that as much. He's had some bad golf on the go, but again, like Olison, if you just look at his past few tournaments, they've been really bad. The putting remains exceptionally bad at San Antonio, but the ball striking has been very good. And that's really what you want to go to. And you can see even at Farmers, he was T2. Riviera is going to be number one on that list of courses I'm looking at as a crossover. Torrey Pines is going to be number two. So it's nice to see that he had a big jump up. We'll try to find some guys maybe from this year. Uh, Pavon, Hoygaard, Jake Knapp. Lastly, there's Jaeger up there as well. Finau, despite you know no putting at all so far this year, he still managed a top 10 there. Xander, I mean, he finishes top 10 at every tournament. I would think that Augusta should set up pretty well for Ludwig, to be perfectly honest. I don't know if he's going to win, but I could see him coming like top five at Augusta just with the way that he's been playing. Like He also cannot make a putt. He's the only guy challenging Batia at all. T to green. He and Hideki are the only two that are even in the same stratosphere. T to green as Akshay is in San Antonio right now. He's just not dropping putts. Neither is Hideki. Hideki at top 15. Hey, there's Akshay. I will, if Akshay can get in the Masters, I'm, I'm going to bet him at whatever he is, like a 100 to 1. But he will be live in the top debutante market. Like he might be awful at Augusta just because sometimes he can't chip or putt, but lefties obviously have an inherent advantage at Augusta national. This we know when Mike Weir, Bubba Watson, Phil Mickelson have all won your tournaments, then you're looking pretty good. They've also all won Riviera too, by the way, those lefties. So Batia at Riv in the future, but maybe the masters this year as low debutante because Ludwig and Wyndham Clark are going to suck up so much oxygen at the top of that market that we might be able to get like an 8-1, to 9-1 Akshay. 
Uh, maybe even deeper than that, to be honest with you. It depends on how much love there is going in. And there's going to be substantial love if he gets in the Masters because he just cashed all of us a 65 to 1 ticket and we're just going to redonate all of that money going in. So I'm going to add this to the mixed condition model. Uh, we're going to call this strokes gain total. And boom, we'll chuck that in. This is going to be our course history. So I can get rid of uh, whatever that is going in, the Valero stuff. So now we can start to even out. We'll worry about the overall percentages a little bit later once we add in some more stuff. You want to get rid of the filters, just go to clear all. It'll wipe everything off the board for you. Uh, we can go into course specific stuff. You can see scoring relative to par has been pretty balanced. It plays difficult about difficult versus all the other courses on the PGA Tour around 50% of the time. It very rarely plays average. It either plays 31% easy, 49% difficult, 20% average. So you do need guys who can score 100% of the time. It works every time on bent grass greens. The green firmness, 100% medium firmness uh, because of the sub air system that they can basically dictate how the how firm or soft the greens are going to be. And they usually put them in the middle because they want guys to be able to make shots. I mean, that's the fun part about Augusta. Like guys are going to struggle because the course is hard, but guys, shot makers are going to make shots as well. I did want to have a brief aside on Cam Young who is not a debutant here. Look at this tee to green performance. I know he's a loser who can't win and chokes away every tournament, but good Lord, this is the profile of someone who's going to win a major this year. Honest to God. I mean, the putting, you have to hope to get lucky with the putting, but it, it's just crazy. He's played the Masters twice. He was top 10 a year ago after missing the cut in his debut. I, I'm interested to know what his final betting odds are going to end up because... I could see myself betting him if he ends up like 70 to 1, 80 to 1. He's currently at 50, and I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of love for Cam Young at this tournament going in. The people, how can you bet on a guy who never wins? Only Xander gets that sort of love. Xander and Finau and Fleetwood are the three that like, well, they never win, but I'm going to bet on them anyway because I don't want to miss out on them winning. I don't feel like that's going to... I think that there is a community who is looking to bet Cam Young at both the PGA Championship and U.S. Open, which I would agree with. I think those are better venues for him, but just the way that he's been setting up, and he's played Riv really well. The chipping, not so much, but he was T16 this year. He was second in his debut, T20 the year before that. The chipping might end up costing him, but you see this ball striking, and it just leaps off the page of someone who can really get it together, and he did just come inside the top 10. Like, you want to make eagles? You want to make these par, these longer par fours a little little bit easier cam young is the guy to look at if you're the one who wants to do that so let's throw in off the tee actually let's throw in recent form recent form is something that i i just feel like we don't do enough of so i'm going to do past 12 rounds coming in just who's hot coming in strokes gain total and who is hot coming in let's take a look here uh scheffler shocker he's hot coming with the first first and second in his past three starts gaining almost four strokes on the field per round Clark, Hideki, Cam Smith, and Xander. Obviously, these Cam Smith rounds are all from major championships a year ago, which makes it even more impressive, to tell you the truth. He only lost strokes to the field once in majors last year um, when we're going back and trying to take a look at these numbers. Uh, as you can see, it was the last round of the Open Championship, and he barely did that. So past 12 rounds coming in, he's been great. So is Xander Lowry. Just Lowry overall. Like, he's basically discount Scheffler. Like, he legit can't putt. I gave up the stat in the top 50 players in the world that he loses 0.6 of a stroke per round in final rounds on the greens over the past two years. That is 209th of 214 qualified players. But if you can just figure out the putter, like, dude is all world tee to green. It's not even close. When's the last time he lost tee to green? Last year's Wells, Wells Fargo, he dropped a half stroke tee to green in a missed cut. But other than that, like, the driving and approach play is gonna be on point for Shane Lowry and you know one of three guys to finish inside the top 25 of the Masters he's currently 50 to 1 he was given a shout out by both John Rathouse and Justin Ray as the guy deeper down the board I bet Shane Lowry 50 to 1 why not? I can cash it out if the number gets better. I don't need to worry about that and rebet it at 65 to 1. But I think that he is going to be a player that, listen, when Justin Ray says something, people listen to Justin Ray and just copy what he says. I'm kind of doing that myself as a part of this course breakdown. After talking with him on the show, 
which you can go watch in the Mega Masters preview, or just hit that content hub in the description. Right now, the link will just bring you to all pieces of content that I have out so far this week already. But 16th, 3rd, 21st, 25th, that's what he has done in the past four years at the Masters. He was terrible his first four times through. He started to figure something out. So, uh, and if he misses the green, like, he's good around the green. So recent form, we're going to throw in past 12 rounds, strokes gain total. We're going to chuck in. We're also going to keep it on the same one right now. And we are going to, we don't need to update that. We're going to change this to past, eh, let's call it 36 rounds. 36 rounds tee to green. I want to throw in as well, just to make sure that we get a full sample of guys that are getting there. And hopefully the putter can run a little bit hotter. So we have so far in the mixed condition model, we have built in the master's rolling model, which incorporates a lot of these stats into it. Uh, strokes gain total at the masters over the past five years. So that course history we baked in shortest recent form possible last 12 rounds overall. How are guys playing based on the results coming in and then strokes, Gain T to green past 36 rounds. So guys that have sustained this for a little bit of time right now. So you hit update and then boom, just click on Fantasy National, reset everything for us. And what else do we want to throw in? Well, we can see down here, lightning fast greens 100% of the time on bent grass greens. So there, there are two different things that we can put in here. Let's click on the lightning filter. There's not a lot of courses that have lightning greens. So let's just check out to see what Scheffler honestly, has been up to here. So you have the players from this year. Two rounds of the Arnold Palmer were weighted on the stint meter. I believe it's over 13. Qualifies as lightning. Maybe it's over 14. You think I know this, but I don't. Tour championship, first, second round in Memphis, all rounds of the U.S. Open, all rounds of the Memorial. Putting at Memorial has translated over. So good news for Denny McCarthy, who comes in gaining 400 strokes putting at Valero. Just stop it for one round, pal, you jerk. But he putted the lights out at Memorial as well last year. Victor, another one who putts really well at Memorial in the players. So the, if we do that with just the with just Lightning, these are the tournaments that we're getting. Now, if we want to factor in fast in Lightning, you know, maybe that gives us... Uh, we'll, we'll see some of the courses that pop up here uh, just to see what it's giving us. We'll see Hovland, the players, Arnold Palmer, Genesis gets in there, Tour Championship, BMW Championship. So I, if you just want to do Lightning, that's why you're a sub at Fantasy National. You can do whatever you want with the filters. It is designed for you to make your own picks. I want to see if the... Let's see if we have it in here at the top already. Season-long player, the simulator. Has Moose run the simulator yet? If not, oh, he has run the simulator. Let's see what the simulator says. Win percentage, blip. Scotty, 13.2%. His sportsbook odds are 4-1. to The simulator gives him an 8-1 to chance to win this tournament. It's not bad, actually. Xander is actually number two. Uh, it gives him a 21 to one should be his real odds versus his 18. Who is the first player who's below what they're actually, it's actually Cantley who sucks right now. Don't like that. Bryson and Cantley, two players that I despise this week. Maybe that's the route that you should probably go. Finau has better sim odds than his actual odds. So does the gala, the gala 37 to one is his simulator odds at the moment. Um, and 45 to one at DraftKings Sportsbook right now. But I said, there are still fifties lingering. Give it to Monday. I don't think the fifties will go anywhere at most places. In fact, they might even get better. I have the 60. Maybe we'll get better than that. Who knows? Doesn't like Hideki as much, which I don't like. Uh, his, his odds are 25 to one. That's what I bet him at. And that's what he is. The live guys are going to be mishandled in this, which will affect the other players, obviously. But there's only so much you can do with the simulations. And that's what we're looking at here. Made cut percentage. Who are some like losers who are right on the fringe? Christo Lamprecht has a slightly over 50% chance of making the cut. I'm sure that'll be out here. And so does Santiago de la Fuentes, 51.3% if you wanted to take a look at it. It's better odds than Gary Woodland and Peter Molinotti right now, according to the simulator. So check back on that. I think Moose will run 10,000 simulations at some point if you want to check in and check out all of that stuff. So I'm going to go with fast and lightning as it pertains to putting. And we'll look at past 24 rounds. That seems pretty good. So we can take a look at the average here. In terms of putting, Cam Smith, the Gala, Clark, Hatton, Fitzpatrick, the top five on those surfaces. After that, Ludwig, Harris English. Might be a nice time to buy on Harris English after he just destroyed my bets and DraftKings lineups at the Valero Texas Open. Homa, Couples, Fleetwood, Dunlap, Fuzzy Dunlap, huh? Bryson DeChambeau, Hovland, Eric Cole, Sam Burns, Nick Taylor. Nick Taylor, not great in major championships. 
in case you you weren't paying attention. Well, he's not great around the greens or off the tee, or I mean, he's been putting pretty well. He actually came 29th in his only Masters appearance. So that's positive news, I suppose, for Nick Taylor. But he missed the cut at the Open last year, missed the cut at the U.S. Open, and missed the cut at the PGA Championship. So a clean 0 for 3 a year ago in major championships. The year before that, he only played in the U.S. Open, and he missed the cut. The year before that, did he even qualify for any of the major championships? Doesn't look like it. So, yeah, the major track record for Nick Taylor has not been good. But, look, he's playing the best golf of his career entering. The approach play, second shot course, obviously, has been awesome. And maybe that's good enough if he has a sense of these greens, that if it's just approach and it's putting, that he can outperform his finishing position for you. I'm not betting Nick Taylor to win, but he is 7K on DraftKings. Oh, Denny at 62? If he, when he top fives this week or wins, oh, people are going to love that. Don't worry that he can't drive the ball or hit an approach. His approach play is actually like decent this week, but he's gained five strokes around the green and oh, six strokes or seven strokes putting through three rounds. That's why he's at where he's at. He has a bunch of middling performances so far this season. So do keep that in mind. So I'm going to add this into it. Strokes gained fast and lightning putting. That's going in the mixed condition model. Strokes gained putting. Boom. Let's chuck that in. The other one that we want to look at, I think, is going to be driving distance. I know it's factored into the rolling model. I do think it's a bit more important. Ah, You know what? Maybe it's not. Maybe it's not as important as I make it out to be. Great driving would be. Who are the best players? Uh, It's just on fast. You always remember the filters that are on. Uh, Do we want to do fast and lightning? And you know what? We'll just do bent grass. We'll throw that in as well. Because this is on bent grass. Obviously, it's fast. This we know. So we can take a look at the guys who are the best on fast and lightning and bent grass. That's easy enough to do just by clicking these buttons here on the left-hand side. And we go to average. I always like to take a look at average. Or you take a look at the spike percentage, which is the percentage that they gain versus the field on these. You can see uh, we have it set to zero. So let's gain two or more. In particular rounds, how often do any of these players gain two or more strokes? You know, that's probably too many. Let's say a stroke and a half. 1.5 strokes putting in a single round on bent grass greens that are also fast and lightning. Let's take a look who the best guys are. Sort from the top. You got guys who just have no numbers to speak of. And then the best one is Victor Hovland at 46% gains 1.5 strokes putting or more over his past 24 rounds. Thorbjorn Olison is right after that. Cam Smith, Hatton, Harris English, Rom, Rose, Taylor Moore. Okay, now we're talking here. Thunder Bear and Taylor Moore. I see, the more I keep seeing their names pop up, the more I like it that they're just having these spike putting rounds. And you're going to need that if you're going to have a chance to compete. That's not what I'm going to be throwing in. You can also look at the rounds that they gain versus the field in a lot of this stuff too. Nick Dunlap, 100% in two rounds on fast and or lightning speed bent grass greens. But what I really want to take a look at is the average. Denny is by far the best. Thorbjorn is second in 18 rounds. Poston, Hovland, Willett are your top five. Harris English, Keegan Bradley, Sam Burns, Hatton. A lot of Hatton on here. It's not going to help matters that he's playing well at Doral right now either. How has he done at the match? I feel like he hates the, I feel like we see him on one of these live streams every Sunday where he makes the cut and just he is cursing out the course because he hates it so much. He has one top 20 in seven appearances. I'll be good with fading Hatton. If he bites me, he bites me. Same as Bryson. Same as Cantlay. If they get me, they get me. You can't play everyone. You can't bet everyone. That one's going to be off the radar for me. Fitz, though, uh, is another one who's gaining a bunch of strokes. Rose, Cam Smith, Homa, Shank. Xander, there's Cantley, there's the Gala, he's down there. Aberg or Oberg, sorry, is up there as well, as is Wyndham Clark, Ricky Fowler, Hadwin and Sung J M. Cameron Young. I mean, it's if you see him come in the positives for anything putting wise, then you're gonna have to go with that. Chipping and putting wise for him. What I'm going to do is take off fast and lightning and just do bent grass and see who pops up in there. I'll add that to the mixed condition model as well. So we take a look at the averages here. Denny, Hatton, Poston, Hovland, Fitzpatrick, Cam Smith, Harris English again. Yeah, I'm going to play stupid Harris English. Great. Justin Rose, Homa, Clark, Keegan, Thigala, Xander, Willett, Burns. There's Olsen up there again. Hoygaard is actually up there as well in the putting range. So maybe that's helpful for him. Who knows? But we're going to throw that one in as well to the mixed condition model. Stroke scheme putting. Past 24 rounds. Bent grass, greens only. Um, maybe we can take a look at some other things. 
I, I think we're right around where I want to be with this. I, I do want to include long irons of some sort. Maybe there's a model I have. Do I have a long irons model that is in here? I think that I do. Let's see. Driving and putting. Well, that's a fun one. Distance and short game. And let's turn that one on. We can take a look at what that one is. You know, sometimes I forget a lot of these things. I don't have any long irons in here. Short iron, short wedges. So really what I want is, to, what's total driving adjust? Oh no, total driving adjusted is distance plus accuracy. Let's throw that one on. That might actually be a good one to look at. And then we'll create one for long irons in general too. So what we'll do is take a look. We have to refresh the page to get everything to load uh, in case you didn't know. Let's see, total driving adjusted. Yeah, it just has off the tee, driving distance, and fairways gain. That is weighted at off the tee, 10% distance. So we're going to crank down fairways gained and at 33%, make off the tee 13% and 53% for driving distance. And we're going to update that model now. Rory, Minwoo, Xander, Burns, Bryson, Victor, Scheffler, Grayson Murray, Wyndham Clark, Sergio, Lowry, Neiman, Dustin, Oberg, Siwoo, Neiman, they're all up there. So Cam Young. So we're going to throw this model rank in here. So the model rank, we'll add that. And now we'll create one. Create a new model. And we're going to have proximity from 175 and proximity from 200. We're not going to give this an awful lot of weight, but I just want to combine those two into one and have it weighted within our mixed condition model. We'll just call it 50-50 and be on our way with it. Oh, 5149, sorry. And we'll be on our way with that. Brooks is number one. Brooks, Finau, EVR, Zalatoris, Fitzpatrick, Xander, Connors, Hoygaard, Knapp, Eric Cole, Neiman, Hideki, Glover, Kitayama, and Tom Kim. So let's just throw this one in as well. And we'll throw in the model rank. Boom. So now we get to take a look and make our weightings for the mixed condition model and really try to play around with this. I mean, we want to rate the, ra the master's rolling model we like. We'll call that 25%. I'm going to weight course history at 25% as well. Overall play coming in, we'll make that 20%. T to green last 36 rounds. We'll drop that, that down a bit, and we'll put the puttings kind of next to each other here for the moment. Uh, we'll split them up into what will be 10% each for right now. Total adjusted driving, which we just looked at, we'll make that a little bit more than the putting. And on that new model, that longer irons model, will make slightly less. So what does that all come out to? 20%, uh, 20%. 1919 for the rolling model and the course history 15% for recent form 8% each for T to green and both putting categories 14% for the total driving and the longer irons at 10% we'll update the mixed condition model and now what we can do is go to the top and take a look at our mixed condition model in full force. And you can always adjust the weightings any way that you want in there. And here's who we got. The, the best players from what we've built. Xander Schauffele is the best player overall based on everything that we have looked at. God help us. Scheffler is two. Cam Smith, three. Brooks, four. The Gala, five. Love to see it. Obviously, I bet Hideki. He's number six. Love that too. Wyndham Clark, Rory, Shane Lowry, who I've also bet at number nine. Those are the three players that I've bet so far. They're all inside the top 10. That would make sense based on everything that I've been looking at. Fitzpatrick is actually number 10 in this. After that, Hovland, Ron, Ludwig, Corey Connors. There's still a bet at Bet365 right now. Corey Connors top 20 in all four majors at 40 to 1. I bet that as well. That concludes all four of my bets. I'll restate them at the end for people so you know, it can be in the time codes, but he is number 14 in this. Burns, Dustin, Finau, Harris English, Siwoo, Cam Young. That's a top 20. They got a bunch of live guys right after. Bryson, Hatton, Neiman, Reed, then it's Zalatoris, then Cantlay, Morikawa, Spieth, Eckroat, and Justin Thomas. Those are the top 30 based on all of the numbers that we have added to this mixed condition model over the course of this show and looked into individually, then added them, then weighted them. That's what we're seeing right now. And that'll do it. On the Pat Mayo Experience Masters Research Show, once again, fantasynational.com slash mayo gets you 20% off. You saw all the tools that were in there. You can probably put them to good use, be it for your Masters pool, DraftKings lineup, outright bets. We had the head-to-head the head -to -head pick em tool. Now as well, there's a head-to-head -head betting tool in there as well that I didn't even show. Turn on your Masters filter and manipulate the numbers any way you want to dig in as much as possible. Fantasynational.com slash mayo.
You want to get in the draw for the $1,000 giveaway? It's easy. Code Mayo at Underdog Fantasy right now. Not only do you get the deposit match of up to 100 bucks, you get a free Scotty Scheffler square that everyone gets who's on Underdog for Thursday at the Masters, but Code Mayo unlocks the Jordan Spieth free square that you get as on top of the Scotty Scheffler square too. So you get two free squares as part of two separate entries. You can make some decent money at the Masters Thursday on Underdog. And don't forget to keep putting your... T- There's massive overlay in the $10 Albatross major season draft right now. Uh, you can use our season-long planner as well to see who's in which majors on Fantasy National if you want a companion piece for that. But it's $10 per entry. The drafts are so much fun to do. And if you go to my Twitter and go underneath, there's a there's a tab on there called Articles. I only ever published one, but it, it, it indicates which players are in which majors majors and who's in four of them, who's in three of them, and which ones that they're actually in. If you want to use that, that's free. It's on Twitter at the PME. Uh, if you want to do that next to your drafts, I mean, there's 50K for first place. Why wouldn't you get in? If you deposit 100, you get 100. So you have 200 bucks. You can play the pickums and use the free entries for Thursday. But you can also use that money to do the drafts as well. And they're, like I said, an awful lot of fun. I'll be in the streets and maybe you'll be drafting against me on Underdog Fantasy. All right? Use the Masters Content Hub as well to find everything for this week. It has all of the information, all the giveaways, all the shows, all the articles, all the picks will all be a part of that Content Hub. It's a part of my Substack in the newsletter. Please sub to the newsletter. It's completely free. It'll get sent directly to your email. But it's also, you can just click on the link. It's down in the description. You can bookmark it and check back whenever you want. If you missed the Masters Mega Preview, it is out on pod feeds and video feeds. So go sub to those right now and check out that show. I thought it was super informative. I learned a ton from it. It had Justin Ray breaking down the course trends and stats. John Rathouse, who is a caddy, and I mean, he caddied this week. They missed the cut, the Valero Texas Open, but he caddied for John Merrick at Augusta National when he came top 10 in 2010, I believe it was. So he just talks a little bit about pin placements and what you really do need to succeed. And I talked through with Raza, first look at DraftKings of the guys that we want to go to. So if you missed that show, go back and check it out. Rest of the the week here's what we got we got me jeff and tim for three picks monday it's gonna be a great show tuesday tambo in studio with me to talk through the DraftKings pricing wednesday best bets we got byron the model maniac and everyone's favorite cam stewart being on that show as well then jeff and i are going to be in vegas live wednesday night i want to say 8 p.m eastern is when we're going to do the live show to finalize everything chat with you guys it's going to be an absolute blast we're going to be at the circa the stadium swim if you're in vegas this weekend jeff and i are going to be there all week except for friday morning when we're playing Summerlin. but then we're going to hustle back and do the cut sweat show live from the pool with everything behind us it's going to be amazing so if you're in town come hit us up It's going to be a lot of fun, all right? And we're going to do a watch along on Saturday for third round of the Masters. And Paul and Cody are going to be there from Dogger Pass for UFC 300 as well. We're going to get turned up, pretty sure. I mean, I probably won't get too turned up because I'll have to be doing shows that day, the next day, and the day after, all from Vegas. But you know what I mean, all right? Smash the like while you're there. Here, sorry. Share the show around. I would very much appreciate that. And good luck. I'll see you next time. Experience! Experience!